And to this, our, our contribution to the celebration, uh, the international celebrations for Transgender Day of Visibility. And we've invited Kate Hutchinson from Wipat Transphobia to tell us um, a little bit about her personal experiences uh, to bust some myths, pesky pronouns, awful assumptions that still persist. Um, in, in the communities that we, we live in. Um, but, but first of all, thanks for coming. For those on Skype and for those um, in Mysofin and in Bangor. And one of the other things that we're doing to, to mark today is Natural Resources Wales in, um, launching its gender identity policy as well. Um, myself, uh, Dawn Beach, I'm the lead for the LGBT plus network in Natural Resources Wales and Kate have both had a part in, in working with our equality and diversity people on that so we're quite excited that that's finally available now to staff, to managers to, to use. Um, it's great to see representatives from all over here, uh, from internally and externally and so just a few things for those that are in Mysofinan, there are no fire alarms. That's the fire escape if we do have an alarm. So phones on silent, everybody, and for those on Skype are on mute. Uh, like I say, we are filming, but we're filming this way. Um, so it's <clears throat> just myself and Kate that will be recorded. Um, I think Kate's going about 40, 50 minutes, and then we'll end with a, a Q&A session at the end and for those on Skype if you log your questions we'll get back to you uh, later on. So without further ado I'm going to hand over to Kate Hutchinson. Hi good afternoon everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Kate, uh, I'm the training um, director for Wipeout Transphobia. Um, I do a few other things, I'm also a role model for diversity role models. Um, with diversity role models, we go into schools and we do workshops with um, classes there to sort of try and tackle the problem of LGBT bullying. I'm also a facilitator for All About Trans. They're an organisation that set out to positively change how the media understand and portray trans people. In this role, I've helped facilitate meetings between volunteers from the trans community and senior producers and executives from the BBC in order to try and promote better understanding. I'm also a Stonewall Cymru LGBT role model and I presented the first ever session they did in Wales at their workplace conference on uh, the subject of supporting trans staff. Wipeout Transphobia, we're a small organisation, really small. Um, we try and do big things. Out. Um, we work from literally just across the bridge in Anglesey. Um, we're a grassroots voluntary not-for-profit organisation and we work with charitable aims. We're fully dedicated to wiping out transphobia by using activism, education and helping promote support and understanding. We spend time raising awareness of trans people and their lives and their issues. And we try and be as visible as possible. We operate a number of social networks to help us achieve that goal. We currently have the largest trans-specific Facebook page on the internet, on our Facebook. It's got 160,000-ish people at the moment, um, and that's worldwide. And we post stories and experiences of trans people, um, all trans lives issues, in order to try and raise awareness. Um, even a number of occasions we've had to work to try and get people out of life-threatening situations in their home countries. We have a lot of information on our website. In addition to this, we attend events when and when our small funds allow. We engage with communities and individuals on a regular basis. We're a local equality stakeholder in North Wales and we liaise with many public, private and third sector organisations and agencies in order to discuss policy, and legislation and to promote trans people, trying to raise as much awareness as we possibly can. We produce our own media, which we distribute as widely across the world as we can. Things like video footage, pocket-sized support cards, um, foldable leaflets, posters ranging from equality in sports to awareness and hate crime. So what is transphobia? 
Transphobia is discrimination, hatred, fear of trans people. Transphobia can manifest itself in many situations, from home and school to the office, socially. Sometimes transphobia is right out in the open. It exists in mainstream media through poor representation of trans people. Hate skewed by certain radical feminists like Jermaine Greer, Julie Bindle through print TV and radio airtime. It's not all hidden away. The effects of it can be horrific. People can be bullied, harassed, denied jobs, health care, to the point where they may attempt to or actually take their own lives due to the pressure. Transphobia in its worst form, it can result in rejection, hatred, violence, even murder. Transphobia affects both trans and non-trans people. The families, the friends, colleagues are also targeted by association. We don't deserve this hate. <laughs> Here we go. There we go. A while ago, we um, asked our lo large social network membership to describe exactly what transphobia meant to them. We had a huge number of responses with a good mix of people around the world, some gender diverse, some not. Large numbers of responses indicated that people perceive that it, it actually stems from hate, ignorance, fear, a lack of education, or varying mixed versions of these factors. We haven't yet collated these as a definitive survey, um, however, we are in the process of doing that. For now, these are going to be a few of the responses that explain exactly how transphobia is perceived by those either on the receiving end of it or by people supporting them. All responses have been made anonymous. Each time we ask this question, we get about 200 to 500 responses. So we ask, what does transphobia mean to you? It means my best friend can't be himself without prejudice. To me, it means unemployment. In the UK, we're, we're supposed to be protected under law, the Equality Act, which I'll go into a bit later. People, firms, various bigoted people can always sometimes find a way of indirectly discriminating and getting, getting you away from their company and not employing you. Hate and fear of what you don't understand. A lot of the time it is just a lack of education. Isolation. A lot of trans people can um, basically experience hate crime. Um, language when you're walking down the street, just people shouting and screaming at you. Just lots of really negative experiences. And sometimes that one negative, just one negative experience can basically colour everything. A lot of people can be afraid to go out the door because of one bad experience. Personally, I know one time I went out for a walk, just a personal example, went out for a walk with my dog. I'm walking along, and I hear a shout from above me on a path nearby. Somebody shouts, tranny. I ignore it. I walk on. Next thing, a rock lands right at my feet. And I don't mean a small rock, I mean a big brick. I'm with my dog at the time, and to be honest, I was more scared for my dog. I walked on, you know, ignored them, went home. I reported it to the police. And then the shock kicks in later. And that sort of shock, that fear, that delayed reaction... That, that actually put me out of action for a few days. I, it just stripped me of all my confidence. And a lot of people in the community have problems because they, they isolate themselves. They don't feel they've got the confidence to go out and reach out for help. Never feeling you're completely safe. Again, exactly the same thing, really. Being afraid to step out your own door is not a good thing and is not something that anyone should ever have to deal with. Living in constant fear of ignorant people hurting my son because of who I am. 
the impact on families, you know, our friends, our colleagues. That I have to be afraid for my personal safety and my family's safety. You know, we hear about the families getting targeted, um, children of, of trans people who are at school, um, they, you know, get bullied by the other children because because their parents are trans, or in the other, other way around, um, trans children at schools who, you know, it gets found out in the wider public, the wider, you know, local community that this child is trans, then all the other parents and people like that have a go at the parents of the trans child. Having the police blame me for being assaulted at the park. Now, I have to say this for sure here, North Wales Police, fantastic. Um, we actually have a liaison group regularly with, with North Wales Police uh, where the community bring up their concerns and we, we have a good connection there, a, a, a good um, dialogue going on. But in some areas, it's not that way. Um, for a trans person to be blamed for bringing hate crime upon themselves sometimes, or basically being told, well, if you didn't go out like this, if you didn't look like that, you wouldn't get that hate. That's not acceptable. Being rejected for revealing your true self. It takes so much to come out as your true self. So much energy, so, you know, to be rejected for that, it just knocks you back and then that leads to, you know, feeling anxious and then that leads to the isolation because you won't step out the door. None of this is acceptable. Trans people, we're people. We deserve to live with dignity and respect just like any, anybody else. So how do we tackle it? At Wipeout Transphobia, we believe that we need to change attitudes. We need to educate. We need to break stereotypes. We believe in visibility being a fantastic method for raising awareness and acceptance. Through our social media, we encourage the community worldwide to empower themselves by standing up and saying, I am who I am, and I'm proud of that. Last year, in an attempt to use visibility to raise awareness of hate crime against trans people, we released a series of posters showing people from across the spectrum of trans identities, just saying, here I am, here's my life, I don't deserve hate just because I'm trans. This is one of the posters we did. We released four in the series, um, included trans masculine people, trans feminine people, and non-binary people as well. To tackle transphobia, we need allies from the non-trans public to also stand up and, and tackle it 24-7, not just when they're around a trans friend. Transphobia also affects trans people who have not come out yet. I used to work in a job which had a, homo um, a culture of homophobic and transphobic attitudes. I was still far, so far in the closet at the time I was in Narnia. Um, we used to have a delivery driver who turned up once in a while, and she was a trans woman. When she would turn up on the yard, the language that used to come out, it was horrific. It really used to affect me deeply, um, because I wanted to stand up for her, and at the time, I couldn't. I felt guilty I couldn't, because I, I was in the closet. I wanted to say this is wrong. I wanted to challenge it. You know, I was afraid that then they'll realise I'm trans and then I would get the bullying. We had our, our um, LGB staff, you know, in that organisation. But the language would always change when they left the room. That's when the homophobic, transphobic language would start. Being in the closet and hearing that sort of transphobia and homophobia around you, it keeps you there. It affects your mental health. It strips you of your confidence. It raises your anxiety. It produces a situation where you no longer want to be in that workplace. None of this behaviour was ever challenged in that organisation. It took me 17 years after working there into a position where I could leave that job and then decide to go and express my true self. It's something that no organisation needs in its workplace. So if you do ever hear transphobic slurs, language, 
regardless of whether there's any trans people present. Please challenge it. Without making it clear that it is unacceptable, these attitudes go on. Transphobia goes on. We also have a worldwide campaign running where we've asked our Facebook page followers from across the world to post selfies with our banner to show that transphobia is worldwide and the intention to tackle it is too. So here's one we had taken from Chicago. Um, I think it was last year, I think, yeah. Um, but we had a massive response. We had people in Alaska, Hawaii, Russia even, I think we right, you know, completely world world Japan. There's a wide range of issues that face the trans community. Um, in the last few years, a lot of progress has been made. Um, there's a great, great deal that still needs to be tackled. Personally, I, well, white folk transphobia, we, we tend to think that the, the key things that can help the awareness of the community are education and visibility. Okay, I'd like you to take a look at this picture. Um, Anyone tell me what these people have in common? You can shout out, even on Skype. <laughs> the people. Yeah, the people. <laughs> they are all trans people, but that's it. Everyone in this picture also believes that they have the basic human right to be themselves, that they should have the same rights as anyone else in society. In that p picture, we have a, a variety of gender identities, people who identify as male, female, non-binary, but past their gender identities, here is still a diverse group of people from a wide range of age, race, size, heights, interests, careers. Um, diversity is fantastic, without it the world would be a far less interesting and inspiring place. In this picture, there's broadcasters, journalists, retail workers, musicians, politicians, OBE recipients, um, writers, healthcare professionals, therapists, and there's even me right at the back. <laughs> we're all trans, but as you can see, we're not those negative media stereotypes. We have hopes, we have dreams, we have ambitions just like everyone in society. So, one big piece of advice on how to treat trans people, a good way to help tackle transphobia, treat us as individuals. Treat us as any other person you would meet in everyday life. Please just don't treat us as a stereotype. Trans people want to live their lives in the way they feel most comfortable, as does everyone. Not all choose to be publicly visible as, as being trans, or, and nor should they have to be. That's not hiding, that's not a form of deception as the media would like to make it out. It's just using our personal rights, privacy, which everyone has. But more and more now, the trans community are embracing our identities and coming out and standing tall and being proud. In the last couple of years, you will have seen increased visibility of trans folk in the media. Positive portrayals of trans people on television now, played by trans actors and actresses. The current EastEnders um, character of Kyle, leaving behind the insulting ideas that trans people are something to laugh and poke fun at, as shown by shows such as Little Britain with their Emily Howard character. And because of that visibility, it, is, it encourages more and more people in the closet to come out and embrace their authentic selves. So, yeah, there's been lots of recent, you know, trans coverage, visibility. But you know what? Trans people, we've been around for, let's see, well, as long as there's been people. There was actually a trans pharaoh in the 18th century BC. Um... They were assigned female at birth, of noble blood, grew up, married the pharaoh, as you do. They didn't produce any um, male children in their um, marriage. The husband died, leaving a power vacuum. Um, I think they had a younger child who um, assigned female at birth. But this, um, well, she was the queen, I suppose, at the time, um, decided... It was time for her to step up. 
that she was going to be the pharaoh. Um, the pharaoh was, I think, by dis by definition of it, is a male role. I can't even pronounce this pharaoh's name, and I'm not even going to attempt to. <laughs> but basically, they identified as the king. So they, they even wore a false beard, um, wore the, the male pharaoh's sort of clothing, the traditional king's kilt and crown, and basically wore stuff that gave them more male bodily appearance. They dropped their, all their titles that referred to them in any sort of female way, any sort of pronouns, and basically even altered the female ending of their name to shorten it to one that would be seen as a male name. Were they trans? Yeah, they were probably gender variant at least. You know, they were somewhere in the trans spectrum. So technically, you could say we had a trans leader of state of the most advanced nation on the planet at that time. The Egyptians got it. <laughs> There's a few other examples here. Uh, 1577, there was King Henry III of France. He frequently cross-dressed, and while he was dressed as a woman, was referred to as Her Majesty by his courtiers. Even his male clothes were considered outrageous, dis despite the flamboyant standards of uh, 16th century France, because this was a time when um, a lot of the men in 16th century France would wear big wigs, lots of makeup, you know, um, just goes to show how culture changes, what is male, what is female. Um, more recently, and you've probably seen, um, there's Lily Elb in Denmark um, from the 1920s and 30s. Um, there's a film been made of her recently, The Danish Girl, starring Eddie Redmayne, who um, basically she was one of the 20th century sort of pioneers. Um, she had surgery and unfortunately died of compl complications of one of her surgeries. More recently, 1960s, we had um, April Ashley. She was a model, entertainer, socialite. She was an oh, actress. She was a really successful under underwear model actress and, until she was exposed by the media. Then she became unemployable. April is still still alive today. We also have um, examples of uh, transmasculine people. Uh, Lawrence Michael Dillon, he was born in 1915. Um, who basically went to a doctor who agreed to, you know, pres prescribe male hormone pills, and um, then went on to under undertake a mastectomy in, in 1942. Lawrence actually had his birth certificate changed way back then, and lived on as, you know, in his um, authentic gender role. Now, no single trans person's story or experience is the story of us all, nor should it ever be taken as such. Um, some of us know from an early age that we don't fit the roles assigned to us by our birth certificate and upbringing. For some, that realisation comes later in life. I was born in 1970. Yeah, I'm that old. Um, the first time I can ever recall feeling I didn't fit in as a boy was when I was around the age of five and six, five or six. Something I really remember well in my head as if it was yesterday. I was in the playground, decided I didn't, I don't want to play football and half the boys aren't my friends anyway, generally. So girls are doing stuff that's far more interesting. So I'm across to that side of the playground. As I do, I'm, I'm there quite happily playing, or playing away for a few minutes. The teacher comes over and it's like, stop. Stop, you know, hassling the girls. Go and play with the boys, you know. Go and play football. Leave them alone. They didn't have a problem with it. It was like, that's what you are. That's what you're going to be. And I got taken by the hand to go and be, you know, go over to play with the boys. And what did I do? I just burst into tears. It just, it wasn't me. I was being trying to, form, you know, somebody was trying to force me into a box that wasn't me. I was pretty shy as a child, and um, I could hardly talk to a lot of people, just really sort of close friends and, and, and uh, family. <coughs> My parents used to explain a lot of it away, 
Oh, don't mind him. He's just a bit oversensitive. You know, he's shy. No, I was uncomfortable. I was scared. I always felt disjointed, out of place. I didn't know how to tell anyone. Afraid I'd be called names like sissy or told off for not being the boy I was expected to be. School was a nightmare. Constantly trying to fit in and unable to. Hitting puberty and my body starting to go through changes opposite to the ones that I thought I, you know, thought I should be getting that I wanted. You know, I, I particularly remember when facial hair, I started to grow facial hair and it was horrible, it was horrific. And one of my friends said, oh, well, if you, if you shave it quicker, it grows through quicker, so you'll look more, you know, blokey and, you know, masculine, thinking that's what everyone wanted, and that was, like, furthest away from, you know, what I wanted. So what did I do? I didn't shave it at all. So I ended up with this, like, wispy, what you'd probably call bum fluff sort of stuff that was just looked awful, until my dad sort of dragged me off to shave it off. It was horrible. I was really, really trying to be one of the boys, trying to do it and not doing a great job of it. I always felt like I stuck out, felt like I was a bit of a loner, a misfit type, feeling so self-conscious sometimes when I realised I said something that made me look soft or weak in the boys' eyes. One incident, I had a, a bottle of perfume poured over my head during a lesson by another pupil, and I was taunted for the remainder of the day. And I was so scared that somehow, did they know what I was thinking? This was around the time I was starting to see newspaper articles. They were horribly written articles, but they, they showed me that trans people existed and that there were people who thought the same as me. So I would have been great to have been the girl wearing the perfume, but not being a boy who was being humiliated for it. Years later, I found out the boy that did it and taunted me with homophobic language the entire day. He came out as a gay man. He was trying to divert attention from himself, probably with no idea that, you know, of my issues. He was trying to deal with his own personal issues. We all have our own issues. It just comes to, down to how we deal with them, if we can deal with them at all. These days, social attitudes have changed a lot. A large amount of progress has been made. But I know the difference that having the right support and understanding when I was in school could have made to my life back then. And these days now, with more and more young people coming out year by year, referrals doubling year by year for young people, um, that support should be there now in our schools. just got a little little bit here on a mental health study that was done back in 2012. The trans mental health study um, research, it, it represented the largest survey of its kind in Europe, provided groundbreaking data on trans people's mental health needs and experiences. Just some statistics to do with the community. 81% of us avoid certain situations due to fear. This can be things as simple as picking up the phone especially for trans women generally, because um, to explain it, trans masculine people who, who take male hormones, a lot of the time their voice can drop, but for trans women, you can't unbreak your voice. So personally for me, that's one of my biggest anxiety triggers. You know, even having to deal with people face to face sometimes, we can avoid these situations. 38% experience sexual harassment. I've had this happen too. I've had men come up to me and literally put their hands between my legs to see what was there. Or literally grab my breasts to see if they're real. 53% had self-harmed. So see, 84% contemplate suicide, think about suicide. I think the statistics for people who have actually attempted it are, um, are around 40%, around 30 to 40%. They're, they're absolutely horrific statistics. They shouldn't exist. And a lot of this is a lot to do with waiting for healthcare or just being misunderstood. 
Right, gender identity, sex and sexuality. They're all different things. A lot of the time they all get lumped in together or people's perceptions lump them all together. So gender and sex are not the same thing. Gender, it's up here. Sex is down there, which is what I generally say in the simplest terms. Your gender identity is a person's personal perception of how they identify. Man, woman, or other gender identities. Yes, there are other genders besides man and woman. Non-binary identities or other types, which I'll, I'll touch on a few in a bit. Your sex is your physical attributes, um, whether you're male, female, or intersex. Person's sexuality, completely separate from the above. You can be any gender and your sexuality can be any sexuality. There are no rules or no, yeah, this is how it is. Um, you know, despite being trans, non-trans, uh, non-binary, you can be gay, straight, bi, pansexual, whatever. People are people, love is love. Transgender and, and trans, they're generally umbrella terms, uh, which refer to people who transgress, transcend, or challenge societal gender norms in various ways. The term's inclusive as many, 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 many subcategories. But just a few, cross-dressers, transsexuals, bi-gendered, non-binary, androgynous. It's important to note that legislation that exists only really protects um, people who are transsexual. Now, now that word generally these days isn't used as much. Some people still find using that word. Some people just call, you know, identify themselves as trans. It basically only protects people who are transitioning from one binary gender to another binary gender. This is really quite outdated now. Um, it always has been, but because everyone always judged gender on male and female and nothing else, and didn't refuse to sort of acknowledge other other identities, that's the way that act was put together. But now, with with people campaigning more for the rights for non-binary people, we need to get this legislation changed. Here's a few different other types of gender identity or diversity. Androgyny, people who appear or identify as neither male or female, who try and present a gender that is either mixed or neutral. Transsexual, people whose core gender identity, their self-perception of male or female, is different than their biological sex assigned at birth. These individuals may choose to change their body through hormone therapy and or surgery to more closely match their gender identity. Bi-gendered or dual-gendered, these are people whose gender identity can be a combination of male and female. It still tends to go male or female. It's, 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 it probably is a binary identity because it's either one or the other generally. Um, and sometimes that with people who are bi-gendered, they often say that their identity can flip quite quickly. They can wake up one morning and they feel very masculine. You know, halfway through the day, they may feel that identity is sort of gone and the feminine side of them is sort of in control. We have cross-dressers or transvestites, so people um, who, regardless of motivation, wear clothes, makeup, etc., which are traditionally considered within a particular culture to be appropriate for another sex. And we have non-binary people. These are gender variant uh, persons who, whose gender identity is neither male or female or is in between or is beyond genders or is some combination of genders. You know what? Being trans is not a choice. It is not a lifestyle choice. Gender dysphoria is a recognised medical condition. Studies in the past believe it to be a psychiatric condition relating to the mind. More recent studies are now showing that it's possibly linked with biological development. We're still not 100% sure. 
still more research into what causes it, what, you know, where it comes from is ongoing. The fact is, whether it is psychological or physical, gender dysphoria is real. And the treatments available to treat the, con to treat the condition have one of the highest satisfaction rates for the people who follow that route. When a trans person decides to make the leap to live in their lives as their authentic selves, we describe it as transitioning. I'm just going to go through a few of the things that trans people can experience through their transitions, things they have to do process-wise, so it just gives you an idea. I'll divide it into social and medical aspects. Social transition is generally moving to live your life as your authentic self. This can include name change, which is a massive thing. People don't realise how much hassle just that causes. I transitioned over three years ago. Every once in a blue moon, I will get a letter through the door from, I don't know, some junk mail, and it's in my old name. And that hurts. That's like a jab in the side sometimes. You could go on for the rest of your life trying to chase the paper trail for that. Um, a change in pronoun, he, she, they, z. Pronouns are really important to us. Probably one of the most important things. We know people make mistakes, but we can tell when people are trying and are doing that. If you ever make a mistake, here's, a, here's just a little tip. If you, if you misgender a trans person, you realise you've done it. Don't do this. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Really, really loudly when you're in a group of people, because generally, then everyone looks around and you're getting attention from you, and sometimes that's just the last thing you want. Just apologise and carry on and correct yourself. Um, wearing clothes that are... I mean, I think when people deny our pronouns on purpose, when they, when they misgender us, that's like somebody telling you you don't exist, that your identity is invalid. That's really horrible. That just should not... It's not acceptable. So wearing clothes that are associated with their gender identity. It's a big outward symbol of here, here I am, you know, this is who I am. And that's a huge part of our identities. A lot of the time, first when you first transition, it's a huge thing about presenting yourself to the world. This is me. The use of to toilets and changing rooms appropriate to their gender identity rather than biological sex. The number one question that every trans person ever gets asked in the world ever. So what toilets do you use? Yeah, the right one, the one that you identify with. There's nothing in British law that stops you from using those toilets, even though some people try and police them and that's wrong. A medical transition, that's actually the process um, by which a trans person takes steps to physically align their body. This may include taking hormones or having gender reassignment surgeries. For some people, it may be just as simple as having you know, laser hair removal on their face. You know, for some non-binary people, that might be all they need to do to make their, their identity fit, you know, their outward expression. I'm just going to now go through a bit of the process of what it takes to get where you need to get with your medical transition because despite what the media put where, you know, the Daily Mail or various other newspapers, whoever you want to mention, make it out as if it's just something you go to the doctor one day and say, right, that's it, I've had enough of being a man now, you know, can you fix this for me? And then so yeah, yeah, we'll just throw a load of money at you and maybe do it. It's, it's not like that. It doesn't happen like that. Within Wales, we have different issues than within England. Uh, you would typically go and visit your GP and say, look, this is the way I feel. This is, I need to do something about it. The GP will then generally at the moment refer you to the, your local community mental health team. For young people, they refer to CAMS, Child and Adolescent Mental Health. Um, 
Then you go and have your local assessment. Now, this can take a while just to go and see your local you know, um, team, waiting list to go. Now, depending on what the consultant thinks, he will try and then refer you on to Charing Cross Gender Identity Clinic, which happens to be in London. There are no facilities within Wales. And, and to get there, he has to get funding approved as well. When you get to the Gender Identity Clinic, you have to have a minimum of two assessments there, which are generally six months apart. Um, to get prescribed hormone replacement therapy. Just for reference, for myself, from first meeting, first seeing my GP and telling him, this is what I'm thinking, I, I'm not happy, I, I need to move my life forward, to stepping through the door of Charing Cross Gender Identity Clinic took two years to the week. And there were many ups and downs in that time, many mistakes made, and then after another two assessments, so it was about another eight, nine months, I think, after that, to get hormone treatment. And that's just to that point. For young people, they don't get referred to Charing Cross, they get referred to the Tavistock and Portman clinics, which basically are specialised in supporting young people. And as far as hormones with children go, that hormone, children cannot be prescribed hormones until the age of 16. They can be given hormone blockers at a younger age, around the age of 12. It's, there's still ongoing debate around that. And all that does is it, it just puts a pause button on puberty. It gives that child the choice. When those blockers are stopped, their body can just carry on the, the way it would have developed anyway. Or if they choose to carry on with their transition, when they reach 16, they can take the hormones of the gender identity that you know, they feel they are. You know, it's, again, it, the thing about trans issues and young trans people at the moment is a big thing in the media, and the media tend to be quite negative about it. I really think, you know, these options, to, for children to have their puberty put on hold like that, it's a fantastic thing, because then they don't grow up going through the wrong puberty and have that horrific experience that a lot of us have uh, went through. So you continue, you have psychological assessments every six months. Um, you've got to get two recommendations from surgeries, for surgery by two separate psychiatrists, um, which it says you, you can only get that after you've been living in role for two years. I was living in role for two years before I even stepped through the door of the clinic. So the waiting list for surgeries at least 12 months, it's more like 18 months or more at the moment. This can go on for like six years or more for some people, this whole process. You know, are there any other medical things which take that long when the, the rate of suicide and attempted suicide is so high? If you ask me, it's pretty inhumane, and I think the fact that we, we haven't got a gender identity clinic within Wales, and the Welsh Assembly still really don't seem to want to address that. Um, I think that's a real big problem. Right, I'm going to touch a bit, bit on, on the process of coming out and what that throws a lot of for, for trans people. These are both pictures of me, if you haven't realised. Um, a lot of trans folks sometimes don't like the before and after pictures thing. I haven't got a problem with it personally. That's my personal choice. Um, I'm really proud of things I achieved you know, before I transitioned. But if you look at these pictures, there I am. Um, I'm standing pretty much in exactly the same pose, looking quite rock and roll, if I do say so myself. Both knees enjoying what they're doing. So what's the difference? Well, Clothes, that's just packaging. I'm generally the same person I've always been. My outer packaging has changed. As far as me up here in my head, I'm a happier, more confident me. You wouldn't have you know, got me here standing talking to you like I am now. Um, but now the body I see in the mirror, now more 
closely matches my identity. I can achieve things now I never had the confidence to before because I couldn't express myself fully. Apart from those improvements, I'm just still me. When trans people sometimes decide to transition and start to think about coming out, they can throw up a lot of fears, a lot of worries, a lot of barriers, which in some cases can prevent that person from even coming out. Just a few. Now, these are not a definitive list, but it's just a random smattering of questions. Will I lose friends? You worry about, you know, am I going to be alone? Will everybody shun me? Some cases, people do lose friends, you know, lose a lot of friends. I'm lucky I haven't lost many, I've lost some. You feel you're going to be judged. I actually judged some of my friends wrongly. I, you know, there was a group of my friends I cut myself off for because I thought, they're not going to be accepting of me. I'll better just distance myself. Then I found out they just didn't care. Friends are friends sometimes. Will I lose family? Some do, some don't. But these, whether you do or don't, these are the fears that everyone thinks about. Will I lose my job? Again, legislation is supposed to be a place to, to you know, protect us. But when somebody transitions, it can throw you into a lot of stress sometimes. And that can affect your work. And if an employer is not that, you know, happy about having a trans person working there, they can find reasons to get, to get you out of a job. Will people laugh and point at the street? Probably, at some point. I can't think of hardly any people, make, not even on, that would fill one hand that have never experienced, you know, some sort of jeering or, or whatever in the street. Will I experience violence at hate crime? Yeah, it's a possibility again. It's happened to me on numerous times. Will I ever find love as my true self? Seems like a frivolous one, but it's something you think about. A lot of relationships don't survive somebody's transition. Partners can be very accepting, but a lot of that stress and a lot of the whole thing of transition can put a relationship under stress. Will I ever, you know, will I be able to do the same activities? Well, uh, you know, if I, if I liked football before, will I still be able to go and play football with the, the guys? Will they still accept me for that? You know, I know, I know a few people, I've done it myself when I first transitioned, thinking that I have to fit into a box and do stereotypically female things. And I did that for a while and I'm thinking, hang on, what am I doing? You know, I'm not even really being true to myself. And then I realised, you know what, to hell with it. You know, I'm just me. I'm, I'm not going to fit that box. It's all, all about being authentic to yourself now. These sound really negative and they are all these fears. And they are like a big curtain of fear. It's trying to strip that curtain back, you know, to see the possibilities of what you can achieve with your life behind it. Because if you can break through that fear, the thing of being, you know, living your true life, li living your uh, as your authentic self, it's just a massively empowering, positive thing. You know, we finally get to live our lives in the gender we feel we were meant to. Our dysphoria can be eased as well through medical transition, as our bodies align with our identities. The sadness can be replaced with happiness, the pain of living the lie, of keeping it all bottled in. You know, I, I can remember before I transitioned, there wasn't one day I didn't think about it. You know, I'd walk down the road and see other women down, you know, in the street and think, you know, you're me, you know, I'm, that's my life. I've been wanting that life and feeling frustrated because I couldn't be authentic at that time. And we know that if we find love, we're being, you know, loved for our true selves, for who we really are. So, I've got a few just really simple, like, five points, just little things on good methods for sort of supporting trans people, friends, colleagues. Number one, most important one, listen. Don't make assumptions. Listen to what they need from you. 
ask. Never be afraid to ask. Yeah. Respect their confidentiality. Somebody comes out of, you know, to you as trans, don't go and tell everybody like it's a new cool thing to have a trans friend. Because that happens a lot. Um, especially in a work place as well. Because sharing information of a trans person can actually be an offence under the Gender Recognition Act. So really don't go talking about somebody's trans status with them in sometimes like a crowded area like a canteen because they may not want you to do that because they, you know, because they told you it doesn't mean they want everyone to know. Um, avoid backhanded compliments or helpful tips like um, oh you hear this quite a lot it's like well if you if you wore these or, or you know if you dress like this or you did, did your makeup like that you'd look like a real woman oh thanks <laughs> or um trans guys like I've just, like, well if you you walk with a bit of sway to your shoulders you look more blokey and you know you look like a proper bloke it's like Really? Really? Yeah. You know, we are who we are, you know. You look nice or, you know, that's all you do. You don't need to make any comments, of, you know, towards somebody's gender. And again, our pronouns, our pronouns are so important. And if you're unsure of a person's pronoun, just ask them, you know, how would you like to be addressed? They shouldn't be offended. And this one, they yeah, challenge language jokes in the workplace that are aimed at trans people. It happens a lot, you know, in, in the, you hear it and people will joke about, say, seeing a trans character on TV the night before. So everyone in the canteen will chat about that. I've had this happen. I've had, make, had friends make transphobic jokes when I've been in the room. And they didn't even realise they were doing it. I, I remember a friend making a joke about, um, it was actually about his wife, and he was saying, well, she's got big hands, she's got big feet, Adam's apple. Didn't realise he was making a really, really transphobic joke. We cleared that up, that was fine, he just didn't realise. It. But it's, it's challenging it, because that's what we sort of did, we, we got past that. Um, so never be a bystander to it. If you see it happening or hear it happening, challenge it. Say that's not acceptable. Because otherwise it will just go on and when that goes on, it can escalate. I spoke a little bit, mentioned a couple of pieces of legislation. Uh, one of the main ones is the Gender Recognition Act 2004. Um, it basically meant that people with gender dysphoria can, the main thing is that they can get documentation that confirms they are who they say they are. Um, basically, you can get your birth certificate changed. You get a gender recognition certificate and it enables you to change your birth certificate to say, this is who I am, I'm male, I'm female. It's actually an offence to ask, ask somebody to show their gender recognition certificate. If you need legal proof, all you need to see is their birth certificate. But you should take that person for who they say they are, really, ideally. You're protected from indirect discrimination under that, under that act. Um, it's unlawful to discriminate if you need to you know, go off work for treatment for your condition. And we've also got the Equality Act. And gen gender reassignment is actually a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. The um, definition under the Equality Act, um, where is it? Yeah, here we go. Um, it's defined as somebody who is undergoing, undergone, or is proposing to undergo a process of reassigning their sex by changing physiological or other attributes. doesn't mean you have to have surgery, it just means you're living your life authentically as yourself. And you can't be discriminated in the workplace in, for goods and services because you're trans because of that piece of legislation.
So today, it's the uh, annual Trans Day of Visibility, a day when the trans community stands up and shouts out to the world, here I am, I'm proud to be me, I'm proud to be trans, and I'm a person just like you. A wipeout transphobia, we believe that through visibility and education, we can create awareness and acceptance. The last couple of years have seen greater awareness and visibility in the trans community. We've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Having support in place from friends, family and employers can make all the difference in a person's transition to living authentically as their true selves. There's no reason why this support shouldn't be there. My transition, the most positive action I've ever taken in my life. Granted, it's not all smooth sailing. But I'm living my life in full colour now. I'm no longer a black and white version. I'm using my potential and my confidence that my transition has unlocked. I'm proud to be the person I am. I'm proud to be trans and I'm proud to stand up and I'm proud to be visible. Thank you. Anybody has has got any questions? I've got one. Go on. When you were coming out, yeah. who who were your your who was your lifeline? Did you have any sort of support networks that? Because you said at work it was it was very constrained. Yeah, that job because I came out of the job, and I think when I came out of the job, that's when my mind started thinking, I'm free of the job now. Right. And then you know it started ticking. And to be honest, I saw a television program called My Transsexual Summer, that was on Channel 4. And I saw a couple of people on that, and I really identified with what they were going through. And that started me thinking again about, hang on, I can achieve this. You know, they're following it, and they're getting to be, you know, where they want to be, and, you know, showing their true selves. And funnily enough, the person who I saw on that programme, I count as a good friend now, and he's actually the patron of our organisation. <laughs> Uh, no. And I guess lastly, have you got any words of advice for anybody that is still in Narnia? Yeah, it's, there's a lot of fear and it is the fear and it's chipping away at that fear. And even if that chip is just like the tiniest little crumb of, yeah. of fear that you chip out, because eventually if you chip and chip and chip and chip, it turns into a crack and the crack gets bigger and the crack gets bigger and then it all just all falls down and there you go. And that's it. Support networks. Yeah. Right. Any any other questions? We'll take questions from those still on the, the Skype um, written. We'll get back to you if that's all right, Kate, yeah. and we'll answer to those. But no more from the floor. So thanks for coming, and uh, thank you, Kate, very much. No thank you. Thank you everyone, we'll take a, a log of all this and uh, correlates and replies to you.